I'm upgrading the LEDs and power supplies in my workbench light, so I thought it'd be quite useful to uh, do a video of it. I'm going to have to work at this side because you may notice that this side's quite bright and this side's quite dark. It's because this side is currently lit by one of the new 20 watts, and this is the fitting that would normally cover this side. So let's um, open it up and start changing things. I'm going to take the cover off first. I'm changing both the LED and the ballast. Uh, although the driver itself was really the only bit that theoretically needed, needed changed, the replacement LEDs I got just out of interest have much bigger chips. Uh, so the previous one, this one, has tiny little chips in here that look as though maybe they're just normal chips that you'd normally find in a 5mm type LED. They're tiny. And uh, maybe that's why they ended up using a 10 watt power supply in it despite the fact it's supposed to be a 20 watt fixture. But anyway, it's about to get corrected. I did complain and the seller actually refunded. I said I'd keep them, so the seller refunded quite a significant por portion of the cost, which is fine. I think the only bit they didn't refund was their uh, postage cost, really. So here we go. There's the 10 watt driver that should be a 20 watt one, and here's the very flimsy um, 20 watt LED. So I'm going to start by desoldering that. Power is off to this fixture, obviously. So I shall start. Oh, maybe I'll just reflow some solder in that because um, it's not uh, it's not flowing too easily. Get some new solder on that should do better. There it goes. This will be useful because there's so many of these fixtures floating around and people probably don't realise you can change the components in them. But they're very modular so um, it's, it makes sense to just be able to swap stuff in them. So, old power supply came out, not very well stuck onto the hot melt, that's alright. So I'm going to cut these here. I'm going to start by fitting the new power supply in, which, uh, if you compare the size, it's chalk and cheese. This this one's much bigger, and yet there's plenty of room for it to fit in. So I'm going to cut these leads down a bit. I'm going to join the live and neutral onto the incoming live and neutral. and I'm going to use heat shrink sleeving to insulate them. This is a point if you've got a fitting open, if it's not earth, make sure there's some means of actually attaching it to the casing, like I've been catching it between the reflector and this pillar here. Although the top of that pillar could do with being a wee bit cleaner. But I'm getting a good earth continuity in it, which is the main thing. So I'm going to tin those wires with solder, lead-based solder. I always prefer lead-based solder. It's unfortunate that people in the European uh, Council, or whatever they call it, European government, decided that lead was a hazardous substance and banned it from um, the electronics industry, which is unfortunate because it's the bit that makes solder stick. And what they replaced it with would, turned out to be much more hazardous in the workplace because the fluxes associated with it to actually get it to flow and stick to a degree are much more hazardous than the lead-based solder and its associated fluxes ever was. But hey, that's what happens when you let technically incompetent people make technical decisions. So I'm going to slip some sleeving over this, thin sleeving, and I'm also going to slip over the other side, I'm going to slip some thicker sleeving. Because I, I like two, two layers of heat shrink sleeving, it just provides extra protection against spiky bits of solder. 
So I've tinned those wires and they're going to flow it together with the solder iron, reflow them. Oh, and give it too much pressure and it pinged off. Hmm. And I'll do the same with this one. Ooh. There we go. That one's not quite flat at the end, so I'm just going to squeeze it down a bit just so that the heat shrink sleeving can go over it easier. Okay, dokie. So the heat shrink sleeving, you judge where the sort of mid position is, and then you slide the heat shrink over on both sections. And I'll use a hot air gun. To shrink that heat shrink, you don't need to use a hot sh air gun. You could, well, you could use just a standard paint stripper type gun from a carefully, or you could, uh, if you're really desperate, you could use a cigarette lighter or something like that. Anything with a sort of that can provide a decent amount of heat to melt the uh, sleeve and make it shrink. So now I'm going to put the bigger bit of sleeve over. And that's me get two layers of insulation over that joint. Now I'm going to um, try and get rid of this hot melt glue off the bottom. But I'm going to put some new stuff in, which is going to be quite messy. So right here, I shall go and get the hot milk gun. This will be a strange colour mixer because it had a blue hot milk glue stick in it. So it may come out blue. Yes, it's coming out a lovely shade. So plenty of hot melt. And I'll just sit this into that and squish it down. The hot melt may actually help dissipate some of the heat from the um, choke into the, the choke blimey, choke, ballast, driver, the LED driver into the casing which will help keep it cool because we want to keep electronics cool, it's always a good idea. So I'm just going to hold that down for a moment until I think it's been long enough that the hot melt will have hardened enough and then I'll let it go and it will probably pop right off again. So I'm going to take this LED out now. The one I'm replacing it with isn't a 20 watt LED, the one I'm replacing it with is actually a 50 watt LED. The difference between them is that the uh, these LEDs have rows of 10 chips in them as standard. And the 20 watt has 2 rows of 10 chips, the 30 watt has 3 rows of 10 chips, uh, 50 watt 5 rows and 100 watt has 10 rows of the 10 chips. And the 10 chips are all in series, and then the, then the multiple rows are connected in parallel, so it's quite acceptable to put a 50 watt LED in place of a 20 watt. Um, and when you do that, it means that the power will be spread more across the uh, LEDs, it will reduce the amount of current through it in, in individual LEDs. So, just to compare, that's the original LED with its tiny little chips, and that's the new one with much, much bigger chips. I'll see if I can just... Uh, I don't know if that's actually going to show up the chips in them. Ah, anyway, I don't know if that showed up, but uh, I'm going to stick this in. And first thing I'm going to do is put a blob of heatsink compound in the middle. Now, I prefer to put one blob of heatsink compound in the middle because in the past, I, I, I work with electronics a lot, and particularly power electronics, and you find if people go like that and they smear it all over, you end up, when you take components off in the future, you find there's air pockets underneath. By using a single blob, 
as you press it down, it squishes it all out to the side and it gets a very even coverage. So I'm just going to sit that on and line those screws up and not tighten the two screws down fully yet. I'm just going to tighten them down one at a time to sort of balance it off a wee bit. In almost every single fixture I've seen, there are four holes in these LEDs, but there are always just two diagonally opposing ones that are actually got uh, screws in them. So now I'm pressing the LED down, and I can see the silicon squishing, the silicon heat sink compound, squishing uh, along and out the side. So that's good. It's good getting good even coverage and even spread. To identify the positive in these LEDs, don't go by the little positive symbol there and the negative symbol there. I originally didn't spot the negative and thought, well, that's positive, so that's the nearest connection there. In reality, the positive means this is the positive end of the LEDs, and this metal here is actually connected here. So it appears, and I don't know, I think this is a standard, but these LEDs have an extra two holes in them here and here and that are right through the metal base plate and that denotes the positive side. So I've screwed that down, I'll just double check I've screwed it down nice and tight. Yep. So I'm going to put some solder on here. I'm not going to spend too long the solder, I don't want to heat the LED up too much. Having said that, it's a high power LED so I don't think it will really matter. And I'm going to tin these leads. Now. Do I want to cut these leads in length, I wonder? I'm inclined to say I'll just leave them at full length and just tuck the rest under the reflector. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I don't think there's any harm in that little bit of extra length. So I'm going to tin these. Try not to over the top of the LED so I don't get solder splashes on it. And this one is going at the side with the extra holes in it, so I'm going to flow that on there. And this one, which I'll put a twist in just to make sure it stays down, will be going at this side. And we'll be tacking on here. And I might uh, just put the reflector on then just give that a test. So here's the reflector. I'm going to make sure that uh, little ring crimp goes underneath the reflector and gets pinched onto the pillar. And I've dropped one of the screws, but that's okay. Let's face it, it's not hard to drop screws. Found it. Right. Try not to drop it this time. Well, maybe I'll just drop it again anyway. So before I tighten these up fully, I'll just line that up with the LED because there's a bit of leeway in it. And then tighten it down. And then I should give it a test, and this is where it'll either work or go bang. So let's tuck all these wires down out the way here. Let's get the live away from the nice sharp metal edge there. And I shall plug that nice in. Oh, that's nice and bright. Yep, that's much better. So then it's a case of just sticking the lid back on again. So if you've got some of these um, LED floodlights and you want to um, ch 
change out of the LED and then maybe it's just getting dim over time or you're starting to have problems with the ballast starting to flash the LED, which does appear to happen quite a lot because the electrolytics in the, the driver um, fail over time. And if that happens, it's good to know that you can go on eBay and just buy these components as standard off the shelf. And they're not that expensive. The replacement ballast cost between about three to five pounds was the variation in price. I bought a few different ones from different places just to see what came through. And the LEDs, um, depending on the power rating, um, they're typically between two to five pounds for the basic ones. A wee bit more expensive for the 100 watt LEDs. Um, but I suppose ultimately um, they do have a hundred chips in them. Uh, stiff screw. And that's it, job done. And as I say, um, you can use a higher power LED, like say I've used the 50 watt one in a 20 watt, uh, with a 20 watt driver, that's fine, but uh, you can't really do it the other way, otherwise it will overcurrent the chips. But with this, um, the current will simply, instead of being divided between two rows, it's divided between five. So theoretically, uh, each row of chips is getting less than half the original current, which should actually just spread the dissipation out a bit more. I think that's probably going to be quite good. So I shall just finish tightening these screws and I shall mount this fitting back up and the job will be done.